right, welcome everybody. <laughs> I'm Charles Herring, Chief Technology Officer and co-founder at WIDFU. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, building uh, global cyber grid, uh, sharing data across clusters uh, on Cassandra. Um, up on, uh, I'm gonna get off the stage for a second so I can see my own screen, but up on the uh, site, we have uh, charlesherring.com, it's my personal blog, we have, um, this talk, some other talks I'll reference are also up there. My social media things, if you'd like to connect, please do. Um, and uh, we can uh, continue the conversation. So a little bit on the agenda, we're gonna cover sort of the scope of the project that we're working on. Uh, how do we distribute uh, configuration <laughs> across uh, clusters? Uh, the idea or theories of predestination of data. Um, how do we configure key spaces? Um, dealing with natural language processing, graph processing, and federating data ops. So a little bit about the scope of what uh, we do in the WITFU project. It's taking in uh, tons of data from uh, different organizations, different users, customers, uh, storing it, processing it uh, for a wide array of different uh, personas. So your standard security operations center folks, so the guys that are knocking uh, bad guys off the network, stopping, responding, dense in response. Um, auditors that are doing audits for compliance, regulatory, legal issues, um, insurers, law enforcement, so reporting crime, investigating crime, dealing with national security. So it's about bringing everybody together uh, and utilizing data, sharing data, sharing intelligence in a way that can draw, uh, drive down uh, cybercrime. So we're talking about hundreds of organizations uh, that are bringing in hundreds of gigs or tens of uh, 10 or more terabytes of data each day. The data may have to be uh, stored for years. So you're talking about a lot of data stored, a lot of data in motion. And we wanna coordinate some of that data, if not all of that data across multiple clusters. So from an input output perspective in uh, each cluster, we're looking at different uh, data sources coming in. So syslog messages from servers, from different applications, networking data coming from the network infrastructure. This also includes uh, flow logs from uh, AWS VPC. So any communication, any record of metadata of conversations, uh, agents on different endpoints, shipping that data in, and then connecting to uh, hundreds of different of APIs and pulling that data into each cluster. Um, the clusters communicate in an upstream or a downstream capability. So um, if the cluster wants to push data to another cluster, it can. If it wants to pull data from another cluster, it can. We'll talk about how we do that along the way. So inside of each cluster, there are different components that are responsible um, for different, comp uh, different parts of the processing. So we have data ingestion that's going into a Kafka topic. And so that's just a raw message. So we have transport of different types, writing to a topic. Um, that, the contents of that topic are subscribed or consumed by a natural language processor that's analyzing those raw messages to comprehend what does that signal mean? Um, where did it come from? What are we supposed to do from it? How's it uh, what product created it? How do we parse it? And then that's put into a separate topic. Uh, that data is then consumed by a graph processor uh, to understand uh, the relationships that are inferred uh, from the uh, signals that are being received. Then we're going to analyze on a different topic um, what we're learning from that graph. And we're going to create units of work, reporting, different types of analytics. Those will go into Kafka and those will be written as different streams into Cassandra. Um, with 5.0 coming out, we're working on uh, vectorizing or using vectors in that data uh, for uh, prepping for generative AI and other LLM. So another issue that we sort of have is every, it deploys everywhere, right? So we have some that are deployed on Raspberry Pi, some that are deployed in multi-cloud, uh, uh, multi multi-data centers. So each node can deploy however it, it needs to be deployed. So whether that's a piece of physical hardware some, uh, in some place, inside of a public cloud, private cloud, across data centers. So each node can be configured uh, whatever, on whatever fabric it needs to be deployed upon. So handling that, how do you connect different uh, data nodes, processing nodes, Kafka nodes in a cluster 
that are potentially geographically dispersed, um, different network topologies. So to do that, we use an agent, uh, a daemon, that receives an input from either a user that's manually spinning up a new node or an orchestration script that tells us where it is, so what data center are we in, what rack are we on. Uh, the license key, which helps identify what, uh, what customer organization, what user cluster is this thing a part of, and what role should we spin up? Is it just going to be a da new data node, or are we going to do Kafka? What is its role going to be? Then the agent uses that data, uh, goes to a consolidated uh, service, which we call library or Whitfu library, and says, give me the basic information I need to join this cluster. And so it comes back with the seed nodes that it might need from Cassandra. Uh, we use some brokering for shared secrets so that it can join the cluster. And so it has a secret, it has a configure, uh, configuration. And then the agent pulls the Docker images that it needs. So if it's Cassandra, it'll pull a uh, configure Docker uh, image of Cassandra and spin up that container, or if it's Kafka, or if it's one of our NLP agents, whatever needs to be configured, it does launches uh, that container, it joins the cluster, and then it ships metrics up the library. Um, on my website, I do have another talk called uh, Metric Driven DevOps. It sort of goes deeper into how all this coordination happens and how we ship uh, metrics. Uh, feel free to grab that. You don't even need to give me an email address. Um, and then all those, uh, all those issues, alerts, metrics, boil up to library. They come to the WITFU uh, support personnel. They go to the cluster, they go to the end user and customer. So uh, this idea of predestination of data is how I describe the overall philosophy for processing multi-cluster data for many types of persona. So in uh, data in particular, or data broadly in cybersecurity in particular, we've taken a philosophy of putting all of the data into data lakes and with the idea that we're gonna figure out the questions later. We'll re-index the data, we'll figure out what we're gonna do with it. But this, uh, this philosophy that we leaned into is when we receive a signal, we need to know everything that's gonna happen in the life cycle of this uh, piece of information. Uh, how will it be transformed into new information? Who will query it? How long will it live? So giving it a time to live when it, when it dies. And so understanding sort of everything that could possibly happen in the entire life cycle of this piece of information is critical to how we handle information, which means we're constantly having to interview the different personas, looking at different end games um, of the evolution of that data. So in building out the schema or uh, the tables in the key space, so the key space configuration, we tend to start with, whoops, we tend to start with a simple replication strategy on replication factor three, but when we have things like um, multi-data center and so we're, network topology, we can move, um, you know, move that as it needs to be done. But the key part here is how we construct tables. So the partition key, and I'm gonna walk over here for a second, but the partition key is, um, oh, oh, are you on? You are on, laser, laser. Um, is the org ID and uh, a field we call partition. And so the org ID is the unique identifier for that organization. And normally a UUID, um, or not usually, it is a UUID that's, that's validated from library. So when you join the whole cyber grid, your, your user, your customer data is generated, is tagged with this UUID. Um, and then the partition is generally a time UUID, but it doesn't have to be. And it's our way of limiting how much data goes into a partition. So how do we avoid hotspots? Anybody that's ever run into hotspots knows that this should be a much more graphic term for wh what that is. It's a painful, horrible situation. So having this allows us to have non-collision in how we're shipping data. We're able to keep a given um, organization's data uh, separate from a query perspective. Um, and in previous instances, we use a separate key space per org ID, but uh, Cassandra does have a limitation as you start scaling out the number of tables and key spaces, the cluster becomes, in, um, it degrades, right? It's, 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 uh, it impacts performance negatively. 
So by putting it all in a single key space, the overhead and the mem tables and uh, those pieces is uh, much easier to deal with. The cluster key is just a time UUID of when we inserted that row. So that's all that we need to know about that. And then all of the data goes into uh, the object field, which is going to be a JSON object. So when we're talking about a raw record coming in that we are extracting fields, that's going to create a JSON object. That JSON object uh, will be stored uh, here. So we're not doing any indexing uh, inside of Cassandra. Uh, we'll talk about how we do queries and indexing in a second. But so these two form our partition key, our cluster key, and you know, combined, this is our primary key. So when we're doing scans, so if we, for instance, we wanted to do a query on uh, a time base, so everything that happened the last hour, we can use, uh, do a, a table scan using uh, the time UID on the partition as criteria. Um, if we want to, what we commonly do, which I'll talk about in a second, is do a full fetch of the partition, which is a very um, kind query to Cassandra. We also use compression, which blew my mind because I'm an old guy, and compression used to mean that makes everything slow. <laughs> but it turns out because our bottleneck is on I.O., on disk I.O. and network I.O., uh, shrinking that down in compression has a huge impact on performance. And then uh, TTL, um, telling it when we're going to die. Always set a default. There is a default whether you set it or not, of course, but um, managing that on the inserts. So when we're inserting data, there's really three level, uh, three types of uh, principles that we take in this. Uh, one is no hotspots, no hotspots, no hotspots. <laughs> so counting how many rows we're putting into a partition. So whatever the inserting code is, it's counting. That's one, that's two, that's three, that's four. And then when it hits the max level, it's no longer going to use that partition key. It's gone. And then we're also going to, uh, while we're creating the inserts, we're going to index what is in that uh, what is in that given partition so in the case of artifacts we're tracking things like client ip username so it would be an array a json array of client ip and every client ip that was observed in that partition and then we're going to save that in the uh, uh, in the partition summary so we have one row for the partition in the partitions table and then we have the artifacts table that or different types of objects um, and then also setting TTL, the, you know, one of the greatest things in Cassandra is the free delete. So putting uh, a death date, when is this row going to expire? When is it going to naturally be garbage collected um, out, of the, out of the uh, system? Um, one reason we do it this way where we put the indexes inside of a JSON structure instead of using a natural Cassandra index is... Um, we're looking at 100, 200, 500 different indexable fields. And when we start doing that in Cassandra, we start running into nonlinear um, scale. So each node gets more expensive if we go that way. So by not adding the indexes, our scope is much smaller. Um, I am sort of excited to see uh, storage attached indexing. It's coming out in five. We'll be at that talk later today. Um, but that's currently how uh, we do that. So when we're fetching, we start, if we want to get a specific record that says, for instance, give me all of the rows that have username John Doe what we, uh, that, that existed in the last day or 10 days or whatever. We start by fetching the partition summaries. So give me the partition summaries in the time range. Give me all of them and check, do those summaries have um, the criteria in them? So is John Doe in it? If it is, that partition is uh, a candidate for pulling, for doing a, uh, for doing a pull, uh, full pull on the partition. So then we just, once we have that list, we just go by each partition and fetch the pull partition, and then we just do a reduce of the rows that met the criteria. And it sounds like a lot to do compared to, you know, select all where, <laughs> um, the, where the thing, but it's very effective when you're talking about multi-petabyte clusters of data across you know, hundreds of indexes. It's, it's a linear search that's predictable in the amount of time that it takes based upon uh, the time range. And it's also very friendly to Cassandra. You're not asking for uh, to stress out Merkle trees and um, all of that. I'm coming up with time. 
So um, real quick on this, on when we're receiving messages, we're using an approach from natural language processing that has a database of semantic frames. So what, where does this message come from? Um, how do you extract it? What is this IP address? What is this timestamp? Everything there is to know about the message is loaded into memory on the processor. And then it outputs uh, in JSON format the artifact. If it doesn't know, it goes up and we start doing our research. So we have machine learning. We reach out to the vendor. We figure out what the thing is and we update the frames. And the reason we do that, I'd love to do LLM here, but it would be bonkers computationally expensive to do that on you know, message rates of a million a second, right? This, you couldn't do that many inferences currently. Um, so once we have the artifacts, we build a graph out of them. So this is just sort of a pseudo of some extracted field. This is a DHCP lease renewal. This machine exists. It has this IP address at this time. That's its MAC address. Get another artifact that tells us that uh, user one is logged into that machine. File Z is present on it. Get some more nodes, some more relationships. Um, another one tells me that the IP address belonging to client A talked to a thing called server B. So we're tracking all of these relationships. So these artifacts are building a contextual graph of what those artifacts are describing. And then we're also understanding what is the intent. Uh, why did it tell me this? It was telling me this because there's a malware exploit or whatever. So now that we have a graph that's sitting there, we're persisting that to Cassandra, um, we're able to analyze the graph. In this case, look for, this is a data theft, a multi-stage data theft attack or crime that occurred. And uh, from this, we can analyze this graph and generate metrics, how many of these have occurred, what types of tools were used. Uh, so you're doing graph level, unit of work level analysis. Um, also, this is just a standard JSON structure. And you know, rendering this is pretty easy. There's a great library um, licensed under MIT called Cytoscape.js that we use for that. And so now we're just down to moving JSON around to make this magic work, right? Um, JSON is great, compresses great, <laughs> um, has great entropy. Um, it's, you can't do REST without JSON, so you already have now the way that we share information across the internet is in this JSON structure. We can nest data so that artifact can be in, can, that generated the node in the graph can be a, you know, a child of that, that can be a child of the incident, that can be a child of the campaign. And you can sort of go from the system to the atomic inside of a JSON structure without limitation. And we're also not having to go and do an alter, uh, alter key space or alter database when we need to change or augment a JSON structure. And so um, there was another talk I, just, I gave in uh, Grand Rapids earlier in the year um, on uh, how all this works if you're looking at the operational side. But you know, we're talking about just sharing JSON objects of incidents, threat intelligence, publication of bulletins. You can publish a job in a JSON format that says search all your data, then give me the results, and then ship that back up to a different cluster when you're subscribing, right? So we're just doing get JSON, put or post uh, JSON, and that can be really any type of information. And then we're just inserting it with that same partition key. So the org ID was, org ID is unique. The partition is unique from this other cluster. So when we're doing an insert into a different, uh, into a different key space um, on a different cluster, there's no collision, right? So you're able to do the same type of querying uh, that way. And then you're left with um, the ability then to have this federated system to where you can have maybe universities working inside of a conference that are able to share data and operations with um, more expensive, more uh, experienced personnel up here, maybe shipping that up to law enforcement when crime needs to be reported. So pretty simple way of shipping data once you just, once we think through how do we create the data, how do we collect it, evolve it, save it as JSON, ship it as JSON. So um, I'll take any questions, but if you want to find my social media or these, this talk or any other talks, that's me, Charles Herring. There's also the Woodfu blog. If anybody, there's also educational stuff. So if you want licensing to play around with uh, the software, we have that. That's free. And then there's my email. I think I am out of time. I have one minute. Does anyone have a question? You may applaud. <laughs> oh, wait, there is a question. Yes. <laughs> All inserts. 
so it's a configurable setting. So in a cluster, you may so um, some organizations, some users may need to keep the raw record for a year or five years. So that would dictate what the TTL would be on the insert of the partition or the artifact. So it's a configurable setting. So it's, that's not a universal TTL. It's configured per cluster. And the same thing for the units of work, the incidents. How long do we want to keep those? Those are being inserted. They're also immutable. So it's configurable and, and are going to change based upon um, whatever the requirements of the given cluster is. In what case would that be compatible with uh, You know, that's a good question. It's the... It's, it's the, whatever the default compaction strategy is because we have, because of the TTLs, it's a very simple compact, uh, compaction. There's no whole, not a whole lot to, to have to work around on that one. It's the nice thing. It's the way, I, the way I, we talked about on the team is whatever Cassandra likes, we're going to do it that way. <laughs> we're going to make it as easy, or, easy on her. I don't know if it's her or her pronouns, but um, as we can. But uh, thank you very much for the time. I look forward to chatting with you guys later.